Well, hey, good morning, Two Rivers. Would you stand and uh, greet someone next to you, meet someone new, say good morning, and uh, yeah, I'm glad you're here today. beautiful day. We are going to lift up the name of Jesus today. We are going to lift a, a joyful noise to our God. Let's sing of the redemption, the salvation we have in Him. Let's sing together. I was buried beneath my shame Who could care kind of way it was my tomb till I met you and I was breathing but not alive and all my failures I tried to hide was my tomb till I met you. Sing it out because you called my name. When you called my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Thank you, Jesus. And now your freedom is all that I know. sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven when I was broken you were my healing now your love is the end and I'm breathing I have a future my eyes are open cause when you call my
reconciliation, redemption, restoration. So Lord, I just speak those truths over every person today, Lord, that we would have humble hearts to receive your grace today in a fresh way, and that, Lord, we would be refreshed and restored and redeemed and healed and delivered. We celebrate and proclaim the name of Jesus and the grace that has been abundantly poured out upon us restoring us, reconciling us to the living God. Lord, we are a grateful people. Lord, we are holding challenges, and we are holding struggle, and we are holding grief, and yet, Lord, gratitude and hope and peace. And so, Lord, we turn to you, and we ask, God, that you would speak to us today in ways that we would know that is undeniable that your presence is falling in this place and that we would be changed because of it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. That was good stuff, huh? Good stuff. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Uh, Welcome to Two Rivers Church. My name is Jason. It's a privilege to be uh, one of the pastors here. On behalf of uh, our team, uh, welcome. If this is your first time, maybe second time, uh, our hope, our prayer is that you feel the warmest of welcomes from us and that you have an experience, a real tangible experience of the love and the grace, the mercy and the peace of God uh, this morning. Um, We have been over the last weeks, really since uh, January, this will be the last Sunday that we are doing this, but we have been introducing you uh, each week to various ministry partners, uh, both uh, in in Fort Collins, but also also nationally and internationally. And so today will be the last um, Sunday for that. And uh, the three ministries that we are are, are having uh, come up are ministries, honestly, that have touched me in real personal ways. And each person that is sharing 
uh, our members, uh, partners of our church. And so that's what's so amazing uh, about today in particular for me is that you are going to hear uh, from Steve Bradley from FCA and Noah Meyer, not Myers from Ratio Christi, and Greg Hook from um, Young Life in Northern Colorado. And they are all partners with us here in Two Rivers. And I will just tell you the wake of the impact that is happening in our city because of these ministries is gargantuan. And it is a joy for, for us to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves and to share a little bit about their ministry and then to invite you uh, to consider how you might even want to be um, involved in them in a personal way. And so uh, we're just going to kind of pass the mic from minister to minister. So would you welcome Coach Steve Bradley as he comes up? Uh, Steve. Steve is on staff with FCA, and then he will pass to Noah, and then Noah will pass to Greg, uh, and you'll hear from all three of them. The first service, it went fantastic, and so you're in for a treat. You're in for a treat. Clicker. clicker. Yes. You left, the first service, you left the clicker right here, and I had to go searching for it. Now you're searching for it. Okay. Uh, first Where's of all, thank you so much. Uh, as Jason said, my name is uh, Steve Bradley. Uh, I work with Fellowship Christian Athletes. Most people refer to me as Coach Bradley, and, and honestly, I respond better to that because that's really was my first name for close to 40 years. So uh, I spent most of my life, as a, my adult life as a coach, and it's always a blessing to be able to get up in front of you guys and share a little bit about our ministry. Uh, but prior to saying that, is the, the really special blessing is being a part of a church that is forethinking enough and cares enough about working and partnering with so many unbelievable ministries to give you an opportunity to have impact beyond the walls of this building. And we're just blessed that FCA is one of those. So uh, for those of you that uh, may or may not know anything about FCA, and I'm just waiting for my slides to pop up, um, FCA is a worldwide ministry. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. This is going to be the 30,000 30, foot flyover of what we do in our ministry because there's just not enough time here to share with you everything. But it's a worldwide ministry uh, present in about 92 countries. But the reality is, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what we do, is uh, our purpose is discipleship. We're about making disciples that make disciples, okay? Our platform is the world of sport. We all know the impact of the world of sport. And our strategy is what we call E3, which is basically to engage, equip disciple makers, and then empower them and send them into the ministry that God's called them to do through FCA. Okay? Uh, we, there's a lot of different branches of what we do. And uh, I'm going to kind of just fly over each of those. The first of the, these that I talk about is what we call our All Ability FCA. It is probably the newest arm of FCA, but one that was long overdue needed. Okay? This is our ministry to athletes that we say they're athletes of all abilities. Special ability athletes. And so what we do is we provide the world of sport for those, those athletes that were often forgotten. Uh, what you see up here is this was one of our partnerships with Thompson School District as we ran an all-day basketball camp for the um, unified sport basketball teams. The, the Thompson School District got them out of school, and we took them through a camp, a basketball camp. That's what you see in that picture. But we also work very closely with other ministries, including the uh, unified sports programs in all the schools, Special Olympics, Fort Collins and Loveland Adaptive, uh, uh, rec programs, and this last Friday night, Night to Shine. And so these are ministries, as well as with Young Life and, and all these other great ministries that you'll hear represented today. The truth is, you're going to hear from three ministries that our mission is the same, and maybe our, maybe our platform's a little different, but we serve together because we serve one God, not an organization. Okay, so um, that's a little bit about our all abilities. Uh, our all abilities director will be out, Angie Miller will be out in the foyer if you have more questions about that. Another part of our uh, ministry is what most people know about FCA, which is the campus ministries that we do. This is an opportunity for us to raise up student leaders to lead their FCA huddles on the campuses, in the schools, on a weekly basis. And our staff train these leaders. We hopefully ha will have parent volunteers come alongside, not only for athletes,
but for coaches as well. We have coach Bible studies in those led by volunteers. Uh, you can read the number of huddles and all of those things, but the truth is over 600 coaches and athletes are touched every single week within the realm of their school buildings. And that's an amazing thing in today's world just in, uh, in and of itself. The next part is we obviously have a campus ministry as well. We have a campus ministry on UNC. One of uh, my counterpart in this ministry, her name's Laura Immenshu. She serves as a character coach for the UNC volleyball team. She leads a coach's Bible study. Okay, but then on the campus of CSU, you see all the different things that are going on over there. We have two staff members there. Uh, we have Chris Jones, who's our director, and Haley Donaldson, who is a rep over there. They work with multiple teams and multiple groups of coaches, okay? And then the last part of our ministry, uh, which is really the part of the ministry that I oversee along with Laura, is our coaches' ministry. It's probably the largest and fastest growing part of our ministry because the reality is the greatest impact people, and it's been said for years and years and years, in the realm of the schools are coaches. They have the greatest impact. Billy Graham said it, you know, I don't have to quote Billy Graham, but the reality is we've all been probably impacted by coaches. And by the way, that impact isn't always positive impact, but we wanna make sure that it is for the name of Jesus. And so what we do is we try to help coaches in a lot of different ways. We take them through a curriculum, the coaches that are interested called three-dimensional coaching. Three-dimensional coaching is helping a coach have strategy of how do they coach the whole athlete, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual side of athletes, okay? Because we, every athlete matters, okay? And, and we want to coach the whole person. And so we help coaches with strategies on how to do that by taking them through classes. We also try to help bring volunteers in to lead coaches in Bible studies because coaches don't have time to organize and plan another thing, but boy, they sure have a need to be in coach Bible studies. Uh, our support uh, system, uh, also what we do in supporting of coaches is we, and it is probably our greatest need is to bring in volunteers to serve alongside coaches in what we call a character coach. And that can be anything, any way that they can serve that coach with the intention of demonstrating Jesus's method of serving first. And if you're interested in that, you can get information at our table as well. We take character coaches through training, help them, and then we pair them and then empower them to work within programs. Um, then uh, we also provide mentorship for coaches. Uh, we've got a large coaches team made up of many of the most prevalent coaches in the Northern Colorado area retired high school, college, and some that are not retired, uh, over 500 years of coaching experience that we can lend to bring alongside young coaches to help them with the struggles they have. And then finally, we do events. And uh, we are in what we call breakfast month. We had a breakfast last week in Fort Collins. We had one the week before in Loveland. We have one this upcoming week uh, in Greeley. And what we do is we have coaches come in. We bring speakers. Next week, our speaker will be the UNC volleyball coach, Lindsay Oates, uh, bringing a biblical message to coaches. And we provide those. And then uh, uh, in the summertime, we take coaches and their spouses on a marriage retreat to Keystone. And we fund that for them. Uh, last year we took 35 coaches and their spouses on a marriage retreat to, to Keystone, bring in people to come speak into their marriage, but also provide them just an opportunity to get away before the craziness of the new school year begins. So real quick, that's just a flyover. Um, a couple things you might ask is, how can I partner with FCA? And I will tell you right now, uh, obviously, uh, you know, we all need partners, but um, we want to be an extension of this church. So it's not about what you do for us. It's about how can we help you find the ministry in the world of sport and take Jesus from beyond these walls into our community. And so a couple of ways we do that, obviously we do need financial partners like every ministry that gets before you and they're all worthy. We need financial partnership. Whether you choose to support a staff member, a specific ministry or Northern Colorado in general, we're blessed by any of those partnerships and 
we always will be in need of that. But really, probably, our biggest need is you. We need volunteers who want to come alongside and help us to get the news to Jesus out by what we do, by how we serve and how we help in this world of sport. Uh, character coach is one of those things. Uh, if any of you know Steve Ballmer, he's not here this morning. He's a member of our congregation. Steve uh, just uh, is going to be, we're just placing him as a character coach. If you want to know a little bit more about the training, about the expectations, and you don't want to hear it from an FCA person, Steve Ballmer would be a great one for you to visit with. Um, another way you can, you can volunteer is help lead a coach Bible study. Um, you can be an all ability vo volunteer. In all of the events with all abilities, we need partner after partner after partner to help us work with those kids. That is always a possibility. Uh, you can serve on a specific school parent leadership team because those students that are leading these, these huddles in the schools need parent help and parent support. Um, serve on a staff member's task force or board because we need volunteers in those areas as well. So what you just heard was really the opportunities are endless. It comes down to if there's a way that you feel like God is calling you to this ministry, we really feel like there's a way you can be involved. And we would love to meet with you, sit down with you, hear your heart, and then see if there's not a way we can help you find your ministry through FCA. Okay, so please, we would love to have you stop by our table if you're interested. Uh, like I said, our... Uh, Northern Colorado Director Scott Miller, our All Ability Director Angie, and myself will be at our table. Thank you, and now I'm going to turn it over to Noah, who also leads an amazing ministry, and then you get to hear from another amazing ministry in Young Life. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I always love hearing about FCA because that was kind of the first place I started to get involved in ministry, starting the FCA over at Fossil, which is still going, which is an amazing thing to see. Um, I work for Ratio Christi, which means Reason of Christ in Latin. Our ministry focuses on giving a defense of the Christian faith, looking at history, science, and philosophy. The fact of it is about 70% of students who are regularly going to church in high school stop when they get into college. So if you're a college student, think of your friends, and chances are that seven out of every 10 of them are no longer involved in church in any way whatsoever. And when we've looked at the reasons why that happens, it's because students are asking questions like, I don't understand the church's view on sexuality. I feel like the church is against science. I don't understand the church's view on this thing. Or I don't feel like the church is even a place that I can just ask these questions to begin with or the church seems shallow. If we create an environment where those questions are welcome and they're given answers that are actually getting to the heart of the issue, then I think we can see that statistic change around. And we're seeing that with the work of this ministry. So we have a few different ways that we go about that. Partnering with churches like FCA is a huge part of that. Um, last year, I came and gave a, gave a series of talks on how we know truth exists, God exists, scripture is the word of God, and Jesus is God. We're actually gonna be doing that again this next month here at, at Two Rivers. This morning, I have one of my staff who's doing the same talk for the youth group at LifePoint Church. So we try to partner with churches as much as possible to do this sort of thing, to equip in that, because we realize this is something that churches and ministries are needing, but a lot of times they don't have people that are specifically equipped to get into this. Most of our staff have a master's degree or higher in apologetics, which is just kind of our fancy word. It's the Greek word for giving a defense. And so most of our staff end up having a master's degree, maybe even a PhD, to be able to train people into knowing answers to these questions. And so we are highly equipped to train into that. And we're looking for more people that are willing to do that. So if this interests you, even if you don't have that sort of qualification, we have people that are just learning it with us as they go along and partnering with us in that way to disciple and come alongside students. So are kind of three ways that we go about training people and getting people involved in, in knowing how to do this. First of all, it's what we call college prep, which is preparing students as young as even elementary students elementary school. We have resources to connect them with this sort of information then. 
but also all the way up until high school and then partnering with churches in whatever way we can. Our other element is kind of our bread and butter being on college campuses. We are on 120 campuses across the country, which for a ministry that's just a little over 10 years is really, really quick growth. Unlike FCA and Young Life that you guys are hearing about, they've been around for decades. We've been around just over one. And so we're growing really, really quickly. Um, and the way that ends up looking is we end up having these chapters that meet regularly on college campuses to get into those questions. Our meetings seem a little bit more like a class than another church service, which is a little different than a lot of the other campus ministries, and usually then requires a certain type of student that decides, hey, I've been in classes all day, I'll go to another one. So we do kind of attract a certain group of students, but everybody's welcome to come and join us for that. And then another aspect of what we're doing is professors. We realize if we wanna change the culture of the campus, the best way of doing that is to partner with professors who have more of an influence on campus, not only because their authority, but also because they're gonna be on campus longer than a student would be, that I can have an impact for the four years that they're gonna be on campus. We're growing really quickly. Right now, I had a meeting just this last week with um, some people down in Colorado Springs about restarting a chapter down there, and then another meeting with some people about starting a chapter down in Denver. We have four chapters here in Colorado, currently UCCS down in Colorado Springs, Mines in Golden, Colorado Mesa in Grand Junction, and then I lead the chapter at Colorado State here. Um, we're seeing a lot of growth in that I have four staff members here at CSU, which is allowing us to grow a lot as far as our impact and having one-on-one -on -one relationship with students. We're always looking for more people that would be interested in doing that. And we're also looking for people that are just willing to show up every once in a while, maybe provide a meal. Usually our meetings have about 20 students. We are growing, but someone who's just willing to provide a meal or a small group or even just pay for a caterer, that ends up being a huge help because college students are hungry. And so that always helps to draw people in. So if that interests you at all, you wanna learn more, or if you're even just like, hey, I'm wrestling with some questions myself. We look at ourselves as a ministry that's just trying to be a resource to this entire community. That's why we're involved in different churches providing this sort of information, being a resource, whether that means meeting one-on-one -on -one or coming and doing a seminar for a couple of weekends or whatever it may be. And so if that interests you at all, come and stop by the booth, um, just as Steve has a few of his other staff members there from the region and leading up. We're gonna have our Colorado State Chapter Director, the Area Director, and the Regional Director, which is all me because we're a young ministry and <laughs> we just have to wear a lot of hats. But come and talk with me. would love to share with you guys more um, about what we're doing or if you're even just like, hey, I'm wrestling with some of those questions and some of those doubts and you want to have somebody to talk with about that, we want to provide resources with you. We'd love to talk with you about it. So with that, I think Greg is coming up. Um, he's got a fantastic beard. You gotta appreciate a beard. Yeah. Mm. Hello. My name is Greg Hook. Uh, Greg is from the Greek word Gregorio. Um, which means watchful one, and I feel like I have to do that after I come behind Noah. Um, I work for Young Life. I'm one of two area directors um, here in northern Colorado. Uh, here's, we've, been, we've been doing this for a minute, like, hey, people come up. This is who. The thing that's awesome about our church, and we all know this, but it's like we, get, we all give to our local church. Our church then takes care of the needs within, within the body and then looks over the landscape of the community and goes, how can the church be salt? and light in this community by partnering with, for, and over, and other, or other entities that are the long arm of the local church. Um, so it's just really fun to be a part of that. Um, our relationship with Two Rivers is layered. Um, this, is, this is the church home for a few of our board members, several of our leaders, and a few of our staff people. So there's a layered relationship there. It's also, uh, Jason was on staff with Young Life a long time ago, in Tennessee, but then when he came here, because Jason and I arrived in Fort Collins roughly in the same time frame, Jason was our college director for a long period of time. Well, maybe four years, three years. Um, so this, we, we have a similar DNA, um, which I'm 
which is why I call this church my home. Um, but you, we've had Young Life in northern Colorado for 70 years. Um, and if you don't know what Young Life is, it's really kind of simple. If you think about FCA, discipleship, and then you think about Ratio Christi, uh, equipping people to understand more clearly the reason for their faith, um, the truth around the roots of the faith. Young Life is outreach focused, outreach focused, um, going to kids who did not know that the church is supposed to be and is a light on a hill. And where the light stops shining as the, as the light trickles its way down the hill, we equip adults to go beyond the church um, geographic impact to snatch up kids who are lost in the woods who have no idea that Jesus loves the hell out of you. Uh, that's what we do. So um, our method is, and you can always say loves the hell out of you, because you're not cursing, you're just telling the truth. Um, <laughs> And uh, our method, simply stated, is friendship, and our message is Jesus. That's, that's it. Um, we want to introduce adolescents to Jesus Christ and help them grow in their faith. Um, a lot of times on a high school campus, you will see Young Life leaders partnering with the local FCA chapter because FCA is an awesome spot when kids meet Jesus, but their family maybe doesn't have a church background and they're not maybe ready for like a, a super dedicated Bible study, but they want to know people at their school who love Jesus. FCA is an awesome spot for leaders to welcome kids into and to meet kids and meet their friends. So there's oftentimes at high schools, you see FCA and Young Life dovetail off each other, which I love that. Um, but we have 72 volunteer leaders in Northern Colorado um, on 10 dedicated ministry teams, impacting 500 students a week at 17 different schools. Um, so when you think about adolescents, the, the people that are in our focus is middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, teen moms, so think girls who get pregnant primarily in middle school or high school, but young college as well, and students with disabilities. Those are kind of like the five different regions of young life. Um, we have, we have nine staff, and, and um, what I would say is because we've been listening to people for a second now. So what I would say is this. Um, the two places where we, where we can equip church members to go beyond the sphere of the local church and impact their community, if you want to, is in Capernaum and in Young Life College as small group leaders. If your faith feels boring, static, or kind of stale, like toast that you forgot about, if your faith is feeling like that and you have not known like what is the injection that you need, I would invite you to consider giving your life away as a part of the movement of Young Life, which is always rallying the local body of Christ, training people, and then airdropping them into the fields of adolescence again, which is a radically different space than you remember it. But um, Young Life College, I always need adults who've been walking with Jesus for a while to partner with college-age leaders to disciple a small group of college students. It will make your faith come alive. It will take you from being a decided, stodgy theologian to a practical, salty theologian, a practical, practicing theologian. Um, it'll invigorate your faith. And if that's not good enough for you, then just think about what it's like to walk with students with, with special needs, with disabilities. Um, we need people to, be, to come in low level as um, almost like mentors for a moment. You could say yes to one or two things a month. We are overwhelmed with the demand of parents wanting a place for their students to be able to come where their leaders focused on them. We are overwhelmed. Um, and walking in friendship with students at that level is, um, it changes the way you see the world. It changes the way you understand the mercy and grace of God. And it changes the way you live out your faith in Christ. Um, I'll be at the table. There'll be no one there but me. I'll also have an AI uh, machine next to me that can take all your information. Um, but... <laughs> Love this church. Uh, love you guys. Thanks for listening. All right, let's stand together real quick. I think there's a sport game today. You're just going to simply tell your neighbor. Yeah, we're just going to shake this out for a minute because I got, I got some things to preach on today. I got a fresh haircut this week. And I am, I am ready to preach, so I just, needed to, I just needed you to just work out. So turn to someone next to you. Tell them what your plan is today, if you've got a plan for the Super Bowl and who you're rooting for. Ready? Go.
All right, you may, you may sit, you may sit, you may sit. Uh, we, I, I do not have, um, I do not have a plan. I do not have a plan for the game. Uh, Lindsay told me this morning that we were going to be hiking instead of watching the game. So I guess that's what we're doing because we are Bronco fans. And so we don't care who wins the game. Uh, so that's our plan. Uh, but I just needed to, yeah, just get some, just catch our breath. Um, Steve and Noah, Greg, thank you. Uh, I am so thankful that uh, these ministers are part of our church family. Uh, they are uh, worthy of your time, talent, treasure. Uh, so connect with them after the service out in. Steve, you said the four yay. Are you in there, Coach Bradley, still? He said the, f- did y'all catch that? The four yay, is that what he said? I just call it, I'm from the South. I just call it the lobby. Yeah, just out in the lobby, just over yonder in the lobby. I think they have tables. Um, I'm going to start this morning with some grace theology, and we're just going to get into the deep end of the pool. I'm going to tell you uh, out of the gate, I'm going to be preaching today. Sometimes I'm like teaching and preaching. I'm just going to tell you, I'm just going gonna- to be preaching today. You're going to feel my passion today. Are you ready for it? I want to start by putting a slide up that I had up last week. From the beginning of 2 Timothy, uh, grace always gets the first word, and it always gets the last word. Grace is the truth, and the truth is grace. Hallelujah. I define grace this way. Grace is the unmerited favor of God. Grace is God's one-way love to us. Grace has nothing to do with fair. Grace isn't fair. And let me just tell you, you don't want fair. You don't want fair. You want grace. Grace is unmerited. It is free. You may have heard the statement before like, oh, cheap grace, to which I would go, there's no such thing as cheap grace. I don't know anything about cheap grace. Grace was costly to God, and it is free to us. And because it's free, uh, we must truly, because it's free, because it's God's one-way love, because it's unmerited, we must humble ourselves to receive the abundance of grace that has been poured out on you in Jesus. We must humble ourselves. Pride, shame, performance, they resist God's grace. Pride, shame, and performance makes it about me. And grace is only about God and what he has given uh, to us. Paul begins the first letter to Timothy and the second letter to Timothy with this sentence. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Grace, Gets the first word, mercy, peace. Grace and mercy are a little different. We are saved by the mercy and the grace of God. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. And that is the truth of the cross of Calvary, that we have been totally and completely forgiven by the blood of Jesus, amen? The mercy of God. Grace is not getting what we have earned. Grace is getting what we have not earned. Favor, anointing, a new identity that we have in Christ. Mercy and grace positions us to have peace with God. Shalom, right standing, reconciled, redeemed, restored relationship. Theology question for you about grace. When did God's grace begin? When did it start? Did it begin at the creation in the garden? Is that when God's grace began? Did it begin with Abraham, Father Abraham? Did it begin when Jesus was born? Or did it begin when Jesus died on the cross? Or did it begin at 
the resurrection. Uh, our passage today is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 to 18. And this is what Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 1, 9 in our passage today. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before, before the beginning of time. So let me ask again, when did God's grace begin? It didn't begin. Grace has always been and it always will be in God. Jesus is the revelation of the grace that has always begun, that was always present before the beginning of time. Jesus helps us understand the revelation of what's true, which is the next verse in our passage today, verse 10. Grace has now been revealed. The revelation of grace is Jesus. It began before time began, because it's always been true, but it's been revealed in Jesus, the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Revealed uh, literally means to be made clear, like visible, manifest. Jesus has made what was unseen, seen, the grace of God. And so as we get into our passage today, I am praying for fresh humility to receive what God has so abundantly given us and revealed to us in Jesus. And I am praying for fresh visibility today that the clear, undeniable truth of God's grace in Jesus would be seen and known. Um, We're going to work through the passage. It's an amazing text, an amazing text. Uh, It's so filled with truths from heaven that truly liberate us. Um, But I'm going to work through it in three uh, different parts, and so we'll just kind of work through it slowly. Uh, As a reminder, contextually, visualize the Apostle Paul writing these words from a dark and damp Roman prison cell awaiting his imminent death. It is a letter of lament from Paul to Timothy. And visualize Timothy reading this letter in Ephesus, dealing with his own emotions, struggling with his own fear, struggling with his own shame, battling as a pastor and leader of the church against really strong opposition. There is a lot of emotion that's wrapped up in the words of our text uh, this morning. So I'm going to start with uh, Romans, or Romans, 2 Timothy 1, 8 to 12, and before I read it, I want you to know, like, this is one long Greek sentence. So there's a lot of periods that we'll see as I read through this, but in the, in the original language, this is one long sentence. Um, commentators would say that if you want a summary sentence of Ephesians 1 to 3, 1 Timothy 1, 8 to 12 is it. And if you know anything about the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul goes out of his way over and over and over again to pour new identity on believers in Ephesus. It's, it's, it's what we have received in Christ. And all of those chapters can be summarized uh, in this one Greek sentence. And Paul gets totally wrapped up in the joy of the gospel as he writes these words to Timothy. So, verses 8 to 12. Uh, so, Timothy, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and, and has called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher And that is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed 
because I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. And Paul just so many incredible truths of the glory of the gospel. He speaks of the power of God. He speaks of the salvation that we have in Jesus. He speaks of God's purpose and grace. He speaks of of the love of God. He speaks of the destruction of death. He speaks of immortality that's been given to those who are in Jesus. In his own suffering, in his own lament, in his own grief, he is totally convinced that God is able. It reminds me of his words in Ephesians 3.20, that God is able to do immeasurably more than we could even ask, imagine, or think. This is where Paul is as he's writing these words of encouragement to Timothy, and why is he encouraging Timothy? Because Timothy is battling opposition, and he's fighting against his own fear, and he's fighting against his own shame. And so he writes in verse eight to not be ashamed. And he starts verse eight with that word, so. Uh, Perhaps your translation might say, therefore. And so when we read verse eight and his, his exhortations to Timothy to not be ashamed, we must immediately connect it to the verse before. Why does he say therefore or so in verse eight? Because of what he had just said in verse seven, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he has given us a spirit of love and of power and of self-control. Therefore, because you have been given a spirit of love and of power and of self-control, therefore you can walk without shame in this world. And he invites Timothy, literally, I don't know if you caught this when you're reading through it, like, join with me in suffering. That's the invitation. To which I go, has anyone ever asked you to join, join with them in suffering? Hey, I'm inviting you to do something really special and important. Join with me in suffering. That's literally what Paul is inviting Timothy to do. That's not an easy invite, is it? It's not an easy invite for Timothy or for any of us, but that's exactly what Paul is doing. What do you think Timothy needs to say yes to that invitation? For me, faith and courage. And Timothy needs to be refreshed in his faith and he needs to be refreshed in his courage to continue to say yes to suffer for the name of Jesus as he leads his church in Ephesus. When we live afraid, when we live ashamed, it cripples our faith and our courage. To be able to endure and to overcome what we have to endure and overcome in our life. I'm gonna read that sentence again. Living afraid Living ashamed cripples our faith and courage to endure and to overcome. When I wrote that down, faith and courage, I immediately thought of my all-time favorite movie. So before I tell you what it is, I want to ask you a question. What is, what is kind of your favorite movie of all time? Don't shout it out, but just have it in your, just have it in your mind. What's your favorite movie of all time. When somebody asks me that question, I just rapid fire three movies to them. Gladiator, all time, all time fave. Hoosiers, all time fave. And Remember the Titans, fave. So Gladiator, like strength and honor. Maximus, anybody know that movie? Strength and honor, like faith and courage. I think of strength and honor. Hoosiers, Jimmy Chitwood, anyone, any basketball people in the room, Jimmy Chitwood, like, I'll make it, I'll make it, Ah, and he does, and they won the championship. Remember the Titans? We're going to blitz all night, and they will forever remember the night they play the Titans. But it's a movie about overcoming racism. I was just thinking, like, all, all three of those movies are movies about Faith and courage to overcome something. And I'm wondering if the movie that you're thinking about also has some storyline in it about 
faith and courage to overcome something. And the reason why I think that the vast majority of you, if not all of you, are thinking of a movie that requires faith and courage to overcome is because we are always inspired by faith and courage. Are we not? We're always inspired by faith and courage. And Paul is telling Timothy, you have courage because you have been given power, love, and self-control to overcome and endure the suffering. And I just, I read these verses and I think about where Paul is and I think about where Timothy is and I think about where we are in our lives and I just think we have got to connect this theology with our real lives. We have been given power, love, and a sound mind. So therefore, verse eight, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord in our day. Faith and courage. God says in verse nine, God has saved us, Timothy, and God has called us to a holy life. And Paul is so clear in this verse, saving us and calling us to a holy life isn't based on anything that we have done. This grace was given us. We need a revelation, I believe, of what has been given us. He spells it out this way in verse nine. It's been given us not because of anything we have done. Grace is God's unmerited favor. In the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of his grace, there aren't any merit badges. There are only sons and daughters who have been given a new identity because of the grace of God and Jesus. It requires humility on our part to receive this new identity. And that's the revelation. Here's the revelation for the humble. Jesus, Jesus is the revelation of grace and he has destroyed death and he has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. When Jesus was ministering in his three years of public ministry in the gospels, If you read through the Gospels, you you will you will find themes of Jesus proclaiming the kingdom, like the kingdom of heaven is near, and he's proclaiming the gospel. He's proclaiming that the kingdom is here, that he is Messiah. And when he's proclaiming the kingdom, when he's proclaiming the gospel, oftentimes. He is connecting the gospel to his death and to his resurrection, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. So the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is near, is directly connected to that, that the truth that he is Messiah and that he will suffer and that he will die and he will raise again. And most of the times when he is proclaiming the kingdom of God and he is predicting his future suffering and death, he will say these words, he who has ears to hear, let them here. So my question for you this morning as we read these incredible truths of the gospel of Jesus, how's your hearing today? He who has ears to hear, let them hear. The truths of what Paul writes to Timothy in verses 8 to 12, again, one Greek sentence. It is so essential to the degree that Paul says you must guard this truth with the help of the Holy Spirit. You have a holy calling to guard what has been entrusted to you. What has been entrusted to you? The truth of the gospel. And when I hear the word guard, like we must think warfare. Like we think of guarding something, what we're guarding is where, in front of us or behind us? We're guarding something behind us, and but we're facing where? Forward. So we're facing that which is coming against what we are guarding. Are you all with me right now? This is language that Paul is using to arouse Timothy to stand up and fight the good fight of faith, to, to guard what has been entrusted to him, which is what? The truth of the gospel. It's warfare language, and Paul is passing the baton of that responsibility to Timothy, and he'll speak about these things in the next verses, verses 13 and 14. He tells Timothy, uh, what you have heard from me, keep 
as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard, there's the word, verse 14. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This phrase, sound teaching, uh, comes out a few times in First and Second Timothy. This verse is the first time Paul connects sound teaching with pattern. Another w- way to translate that word that translated pattern is model. The pattern or the model of sound teaching that's been given to you is what you've been entrusted with. One of the commentators that I was reading this week on this particular phrase, the pattern of sound teaching, uh, understood it this way and taught it this way. Paul makes it unmistakably clear that Timothy is not at liberty to deviate from the apostolic teaching. He is to guard what has been entrusted to him, and he is called to proclaim that in word and deed as well. It's a holy responsibility that's been given to Timothy. And again, it is a battle cry. It is so important. These truths are so important. And the responsibility to guard it is so important that Paul tells Timothy, yes, I'm calling you to guard it. And yes, it is a battle cry, but you have been given the Holy Spirit to help you. And the empowerment of that is in verse 12. And so what I want you to do is connect verse 14 to verse 12. Because in 14 is the exhortation for Timothy to guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. And then he says, guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit. But be reminded of what he had just told Timothy in verse 12 when he said, I am convinced that he is able to guard Like, I am convinced that the Holy Spirit is able to guard. And because that's true, I can exhort you to guard with the Holy Spirit's help. So if you're a note taker, I would invite you to write this phrase down. I am able to guard because the Holy Spirit is able. I am able because he is able. I have been empowered and enabled to partner with the Holy Spirit in the advancement of God's kingdom and to guard what has been entrusted to us. Is this relevant for us today? All this, all this language about the truth of the gospel and guarding the truth of the gospel and we need the help of the Holy Spirit. Is this, is this relevant today or do you think it was just relevant for first century Rome? I'm speaking in tongue in cheek. I believe it's certainly relevant for us today. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it runs counter to relativism. It runs counter to pluralism, to polytheism, and to the self-worship of our day. To proclaim the name of Jesus. If you proclaim the name of Jesus, you will stand out in this world. The question isn't, if your testimony is, I believe in the name of Jesus, I have received the grace in Jesus, I I come under the authority of Jesus, I come under the blood of Jesus, I believe that Jesus has defeated death and has given immortal life to immortal people by the name of Jesus, by faith, When you proclaim that, you stand out, period. The question isn't if you stand out. The question is, will you stand up and witness for the truth of the gospel? That's what Paul is exhorting Timothy to do, to not be ashamed of the name of Jesus leading, pastoring, caring, ministering in Ephesus. Jesus said this in John 14, 6. Very, very famous, well-known verse. The context of this verse is in the Last Supper. It's, before, it's, on good, it's the day before Good Friday. Jesus says this on Thursday before Good Friday to his disciples, John 14, 6. Like grace is radically inclusive, truly radically inclusive for all, for all who will come. 
And if you want some insight into how radically inclusive the gospel is, refresh your memory by writing down Matthew 22. It's the parable of the great wedding banquet. And read what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 22. Invite everyone. The invitation is radically inclusive, but the way of salvation is exclusive, and it's Jesus alone by grace alone. Jesus says these words, Last Supper, day before he would go to the cross, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There aren't many saviors. There is one savior. His name is Jesus, the Lord of glory, King Jesus. I I believe this is absolutely true, and I proclaim it to you. Grace is, again, radically inclusive to all who come, but the message of the gospel of the way of salvation is Jesus. Here's Peter's words. Right after the resurrection, Jesus had just ascended from the Mount of Olives, Acts chapter one. The disciples are getting all kind of opposition. And and, and Peter, encouraged, stands up. Acts 4, 12, salvation is found in no one but Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind which we must be saved. The world's message. This is why I believe this is so relevant. The world's message is no system can claim absolute truth. The world's message is if it feels good, do it. The world's message is do what makes you happy. The message of Christ is, I am the way. I am not a way. I am the way, the truth, the life. The message of Christ is, you must deny yourself to be my disciple. The message of Christ is, you are called, you are called by God to a holy life, a life that carries the aroma of heaven. The message of Christ is God, 1 John 4, God is love. God is the essence and the totality of love and the revelation of love is Jesus. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. Is it hard in our day to stand up for the truth of the gospel? Yes. Will you, be, will you be misunderstood? Will you be persecuted? Yes. Did Jesus tell the disciples that the world would hate, literally hate them for proclaiming his name? Yes. Jesus never said it would be easy. He just said it would be worth it. And in our text today, Paul never said it would be easy either. Paul Paul is not giving Timothy a light and fluffy Christianity to walk in. Would you agree with that? He is literally inviting Timothy to suffer for the gospel. And the living and active word of God is inviting you today, will you suffer for the name of Jesus? Will you stand out? Will you stand up? In grace, in mercy, in love, in kindness, it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance. But will you stand for your faith? Paul never said it would be easy either. He knows it all too well. Remember, he's writing from his death cell, church. And he knows all too well the pain of relational betrayal. The next verses in our chapter, and it ends the chapter, gives insight into some of Paul's own personal relationships and the sting of betrayal in his own life. Again, there is much for Paul to lament in these, in these words, and that includes relational lament. And he will speak about that in these last verses, verses 15 to 16. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me. And I just go, we have to remember that Paul is a human being, and he is holding a lot of emotion in that jail cell. 
And I don't know about those of you in the room who are also married like me, but when you get exasperated in marriage, you tend to use extreme qualifiers, right? Always, never, anyone, maybe just me, no? Paul's like, he's like, everyone in Asia deserted me, right? Is it true? We don't know, but he is feeling the deep emotion of those who have betrayed him. And it feels like everyone. But then he specifically names two people that we don't really know anything about, but we know that Timothy knows them. And he knows that Timothy will feel the weight of what Paul is feeling about their betrayal. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. And Timothy's like, no. Verse 16, but may the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. After this morning, you are never going to forget the name of Onesiphorus again. Some of you have never heard of the name Onesiphorus. You did not even know that name was in the Bible. And forever until the day you die, you will never forget Onesiphorus. I'm telling you, Onesiphorus. Why? Why is Paul just speaking all this blessing to Onesiphorus and over his whole family? Because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. Can you imagine how hard it was for Onesiphorus to find Paul in Rome? Paul was in prison for proclaiming the name of Jesus. Onesiphorus was a disciple of Jesus. Not only hard to find out where they were holding Paul, but somehow, some way, Onesiphorus got to Paul and he refreshed Paul. And that phrase, he searched hard for me until he found me. I didn't know that verse was in the Bible until this week. Oh, not, when I think of like, like brotherhood, like verses like in Proverbs, oh, it's literally, I just, it's literally right here. Iron sharpens iron. Right, I think it, iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. But now, now we got this too, Onesiphorus. He searched hard for me until he found me. And what did he do when he found him? He refreshed Paul. It's incredible, incredible insight into what was happening in his personal life. May the Lord grant that Onesiphorus will find mercy from the day, from the Lord on that day. And you know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. Chapter two, you then, my son Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Like Onesiphorus, do not be ashamed of the name of Jesus. Man. He searched hard for me until he found me. I got friends like that. I got friends like that. Andrew, Nate, Steve, Connor, Kenny, Andrew, Jimmy, Ben, Ben, Steve, Greg, Paul, I could go on and on. Jeff, Jeff, JJ, I mean, I could go on and on. I got friends like that. And I wanna be a friend like that. Who do you know in prison? Who do you know in prison? I'm telling you right now, you know someone in prison. Maybe not a first century Roman cell, but you know someone in prison and they need to be refreshed. Who do you know? In prison to fear? In prison to shame? Someone held captive by addiction or disease? Perhaps someone you know that's so stuck in their grief and in their hardship that they can't lament, they can't turn to God. Maybe bitterness and resentment is so rooted in them that they are blind to the truth. 
Who do you need to search hard for until you find them? Who? Maybe, maybe you are the one that needs finding. Maybe as I share these words, and you hear this story of Paul and Onesiphorus, maybe you are the one that needs finding, and it's time to let someone know, I need refreshment. And I'm telling you right now, I am searching hard for you right now. Four buddies, four buddies got their friend to Jesus by literally digging through a roof. That is legit. Would you agree? It might take digging through a roof. Like, I don't know what kind of tools they had, but I guarantee you they were sweating. Their knuckles were probably bleeding. And they did it. All right, got to close. Got to close. Worship team, you can come back up. This is an incredible text. Incredible text. Last thing I want to say is this. Death is the enemy. And death is a defeated enemy. Christ Jesus has destroyed death and brought life, immortality to light in the gospel. For believers and followers of Jesus, we need not fear death. Amen? We have been given immortality. Death is our entrance into glory. And it's why when we go to celebration of life services, we worship and sing with gratitude. Certainly we're in grief, but we're not in grief like those who do not have hope. We are in grief like those who do have hope. Hope of what? Hope of literally being in the presence of the glory of God in heaven. This is our faith. I want to read some verses over you as a prayer from the message this morning from Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to invite you to stand as I do this and then we'll worship together. Jesus, from Hebrews chapter 2, Jesus is now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. And in bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. And since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And he became the source of eternal salvation. Jesus Christ is calling you by his grace and his mercy to give you peace with God. Come home. Come home. Let's worship.
feel like there's someone in this room that needs to continue singing that over themselves. Not because they have crazy strong faith and believe it so strongly, but because they need to proclaim it more and more until their heart softens to believe that He is truly good, that He is truly faithful, that He is truly there for you. And you're never gonna, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna, you're never gonna. Come on, sing it over yourself. Break down those walls. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. dark, damp prison cell awaiting death. And Onesiphora somehow, some way, by the grace of God, was able to get to Paul to refresh him. Do you think they sang? There's something about the filling of God's spirit when God's people sing because it raises our gaze to heaven. The joy of the Lord our strength. Amen. Worship team, thank you. Thank you for being here. I want to let you know there's a couple of big things happening next week. Uh, One is a foundations kind of discipleship class that we're starting next Sunday morning at 830 in the morning. If that's something that you're interested in, uh, we have a sign up for that uh, on the newsletter. And so I want to make you aware of that. Also, I think there's maybe one or two engaged couples in the room. No, it's like nine or ten now, I think. Love is in the air at Two Rivers Church, and it's almost Valentine's Day. We're having a premarital class that's coming, so uh, couples pay attention to that. And then uh, dads of daughters, uh, our annual daddy-daughter dance is next next Saturday. And uh, I'm going to give a benediction. And then you're going to be officially dismissed, but we're going to just play like a video of last year's dance. It's kind of an outro today, so you can enjoy that on your way out. That's happening next Saturday. So let me me just remind you of Paul's words to Timothy as your benediction. You then, my son, 
be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others, who will also be able to refresh others. If you have been refreshed today, go be a refreshment to someone. Search hard until you find them. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Ministry team is available down front. If you want to receive prayer, I'll be down front as well for that as well.